it's Wednesday, and that means Whiteboard Wednesday. Okay, so uh, this week's episode, if you took a look at things ahead of time, if not, you're just jumping in, no harm, no foul, right? We're going to take another look at our locks, holds, and throws, but actually we're going to look at the, at, the, at the kind of the backside of things, right? Um, so let's do this. We're going to be moving through some things that are kind of foundational and uh, moving through, right, so we can understand how these things go together. So um, here's just a, a quick heads up. If you're here to learn how to do the locks, holds, and throws, that's not this class, right? You can go find another Whiteboard Wednesday or one of the other uh, videos that we have up. Or, hell, if you're on YouTube, just, I don't know, let your mouse do the walking, right? Okay, We're actually going to go beyond that. Okay, But to start, what I want to do is, is take a look at uh, three levels of training as we're progressing through. Okay, And this can be seen globally for your whole training regimen, right? Your whole progress or for any given skill uh, that you're working on. Okay. So for those of you who are familiar with the traditional side of things, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I have a worksheet that my inner circle guys get my in, uh, uh, in dojo guys and my guys that are around the world working uh, distance learning. And then they come in for seminars and stuff like that. I have a bunch of worksheets and things like that for them. So one of the ones that they get, and I'm not going to outline the whole thing, but we break down their training. And again, this is inverse the way I'm writing it now, right? Because if we were looking at foundational, it would work this way. But because we're typically Westerners, right? We'll, we'll write it out this way, okay? So first level of training, right? It's mechanics. It's focused on mechanics, okay? Where do I put my foot? What do I do with my arm? What part of his body do I touch with whatever, okay? So mechanics, right? This is the form right? It's how do I do whatever, right? To him. Okay. So if we're talking about a throw, right? Uh, normally you're given an introductory model, right? For Gan Sekinage or, or uh, Omo de Gaku or whatever. And if it's different for different lineages, uh, since we have nine, right? Uh, within the Bujikan, just nine formal ones, right? Okay. Then uh, we'll specify this one's from over here, like the Gyokoryu uh, introductory model for Omote Gyaku is different from the general one that might be used by Koto or if it's Kote Gaish from Kukishinden or whatever, right? But anyway, mechanics, right? This is the how-to, okay? How-to and it's physical. I mean, ultimately we're doing martial arts, so a lot of it's physical, but uh, so we need to know how to do in this case, the lock, the hold, the throw, whatever. But it could be the kata. It could be the roll. It could be whatever, right? Okay? And once we get this, okay, then we're moving into a stage that I call dynamics. Okay? Dynamics, right? This is, um, it's still, you're still working with form, right? But it, so if this is the what and the how, right? This is the when, oops, only one, when, where, right, how much, okay? So this really starts to break things down um, to where we're looking at, at at least three core principles, okay? So this is very principle-based. Okay, principle based. So here we're looking at uh, timing. We're looking at distance. My right distance, and we're looking at angling. But we're also looking at balance, mine and his. We're also looking. There's a whole bunch of things that we're looking at, right? So timing. What's the best time? Not just to step in and do the whole throw, right? But what's the best time to make contact with his arm? What's the best time to step? What's the best, okay? That kind of thing, right? Okay, and again, balance. Th these things are, are not just um, when do I throw him or whatever, but it's also the timing of my body and whatnot. My guys going from showdown to knee-down have three different uh, flow uh, considerations, three different types of timing, right, that they have to have for knee-down uh, to, to get a handle on this thing, right? This then pushes everything to the next point, which is, we'll call it intent and or staging, okay? This 
is the, uh, we'll call it transcending form, right? Okay, so we're going to transcend form. That means we don't need the form anymore, right? Uh, and again, like I said, if you're if you're jumping on this thing to to learn how to do certain locks, holds, or throws, um, this is not the right class. Okay, put the, listen to it, download it, whatever, right? Um, however you're going to do it, right? Put it on the shelf for when you're ready for that. Okay, we're going to talk about a major problem that that occurs. Um, in training for a lot of people, especially the do-it-yourselfers, but this can happen in the dojo a lot as well, right? Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But in this case, right, what we're looking at here is we have all this stuff, right? We know the what, the when, and all that, right? But as a part of this stage right here, this one, we're also working variations, right? Okay? How many different ways can any given technique be applied? Okay. I mean, I'd like to use the word infinite, but there are finite, there, there are gaps or caps to it because there's only so many things you can do with a human body, so many things you can do to a human body. But when we're working um, in here, right, how many different, how many different approaches, how might he grab those kind of things, right? This transforms into variations down here as well, but it's not the same. The variations down here tend to be more environmental and situational, okay? So what we have going on down here, if we're looking at intent, right? What outcome do I want? If I'm talking to my law enforcement guys, right? My military police, my federal guys, whatever, right? I don't care in what position you're in, law enforcement, security, whatever, okay? Let's say I need this guy in a prone position, face down, so I can do a quick pat down, get him into cuffs or zip lock, uh, zip ties or whatever, right? Okay. Then what I'm learning here is which which of these locks, holds, or throws move him more easily in that direction. At this level, what do I need, right? What do I need to be paying attention to so that that is the right answer to move him in that direction, okay? This stuff down here is why do I need him there? Okay, so while well, these are the hows and the whats, and this is the when, where, how much, that kind of thing, right? This is the why, right? For a lot of people, they just want to kick ass, right? They got involved in martial arts or self-defense or whatever, so they could be the baddest guy on the block, or they could just survive and get home or whatever, in which case, a lot of this stuff, right? I mean, it's obviously going to help because the, the more of this you have, the less work you're going to have to do, okay? But... If, if your only goal, right, is just to drop the guy and be able to take off or whatever, then you decide, okay? But for the guys that need or that recognize the need for situational control, and that's really what's going on down here, situational control, right? We've transcended. We've gone beyond the models. We've gone beyond even what people would call the style or the art, right? And it's become very personalized, but in that moment – it almost looks like we're just making up shit as we go along, okay? But the stuff that's made up is made of the same building blocks we put in because they're in muscle memory, they're in intuitive sense, the, the logic and all that stuff is working, okay? So I apologize if I'm scrambling people's brains. We're going to get to another thing here in a moment, but mechanics, dynamics, and tech. This is going to be important to, to hold on to and remember because today's class is working in here. And this preps for this, okay? So if you're still working on the mechanics, if you're still working on how to get the step one, step two of an onikodaki, an omotegyaku, a gansekinagi, whatever, right? Then you need to keep working on those, okay? I talked about a problem earlier, right? One of the problems for a lot of folks in training is it's either unconscious or it's conscious, okay? And it's either... It's accidental because people don't know any better or it's intentional because everybody wants to get here as fast as possible. And I get it, right? Except that often development is not a drive up window system, okay? You don't pull up to window number one, order technique number 27, pay your, you know, your bucks or your time or whatever, and then you pull up the technique or the second window, they slide open that glass door, you bought a kick, so they kick you in the face, 
give you a video for it and send you on your on your way, right? This stuff it doesn't work that way, okay? As, as people like to say, right? That's not the way it works, right? Okay? I'm sure you've told people that, okay? But what ends up happening is things are presented. Well, here's an example. My very first training experience with my first teacher in this art, okay? I read the, the summary, the outline in a newsletter, right? I can afford that. I can get time off for that. What? And I just went, right? It wasn't until probably midway through the first day that I was introduced to the idea that all the stuff that we were working on was for second degree and above in the way our curriculum is laid out, right? Second degree and above, which means that the person is able to use their basics. They're able to string their basics together in an unbroken flow based on the actions of the attacker on the street, not in the dojo. So the attacker, a single attacker can do whatever they want at speed. Okay. And you don't have to use high school wrestling, tic-tac-toe, boxy karate, whatever. Okay. Um, you can use this stuff to handle that person. That's kind of the overarching definition of what it takes to get a knee on for me. Uh, unless you, I don't know, unless you're screwing around too much and I'll pull out some sensei on you and promote you way faster and then leave you to your own devices if you can't figure out that you're now out of your depth and you are now forced to train more, okay? It's only bitten me twice in my entire teaching history where somebody gets it out of their mouth. They go, I know I'm not ready for that. I'm going to button down. And then they quit very shortly after so they can strut around the world with their kotsu, right? Their ego bone sticking out. I got this. And okay? give a guy a knee on in Japan. Actually, he, he wasn't going to be happy unless he got one. So he paid for one. Okay. Got kicked out of the dojo all the way back, but he paid for one. And then later on, we see, because we're all ninja, right? Information gathering, right? We see that he's posting on Facebook and whatnot that he's a direct student of Grandmaster Hatsumi. Pride goes before the fall, right? People do what people do, um, regardless of who, who they want to blame. Anyway, so there's all this chaos, right? Uh, there's all this stuff, right? There's mechanics in there. There's dynamics, which they may or may not be able to see. They're staging an intent, which they may or may not be able to see. What they see is the outcome. They want to be able to do that thing. But what most people want to do, what ego wants to do, is jump over the training process that the master they're watching went through. They want to jump over that and just get here. Okay? How's it feel to want? It's pretty much what my teachers used to ask. Okay? So, again, we, we have to have the pieces. We have to know how to do the technique, right? But people here want to ask why, right? So let's let's take a quick look at this at this uh, traditional system, right? The shuha. Who don't know it, right? For those of you who do, um, control your eye roll, right? Maybe I'll say something that uh, you didn't hear before. Okay, right? do this very very quickly because I want to get to the the locks, holds, and throws. But we we need to be careful that we don't that we don't screw around with, with the process, the natural growth learning process, right? Okay, so uh, there's this traditional Japanese, probably comes from pre-Japan uh, as, as martial arts filtered into these different places, right? China, probably even before China, along the Silk Road, back into Tibet, India, those kind of places, right? But this model is called Shuhari, okay? Shuhari, can you see that? Should be able to see it, right? Zoom in a little bit, okay? Shuhari, okay? So shu, this word shu, right? Not shu like in shuto, okay? That means hand, right? It's the alternate pronunciation or the alternate uh, way of, of pronouncing the kanji, right? For hand, so instead of te, karate, right? Shu, shuto, right? So and that, it's not the different, that, not the same one, different kanji. So this shu means to copy, or preserve. Okay, and this is where everyone starts. Okay, now again, people watch videos on YouTube, right? So, so it doesn't matter which one you click on, right? You're gonna click on things. The cool thing about having a teacher and a teacher that understands how this structure and and 
how to get you there as quickly as possible by using a proven framework that's centuries old, right? Is that they're going to be giving it to you in a specific order so that growth occurs as opposed to just throwing up on you and throwing a bunch of crap at you. And then you need to flounder and figure it out, right? Or you have to be naturally intuitive and figure it out, right? But that the teacher also, if they're good, should be reigning in your ego, okay? Reminding you things every once in a while, a little poke or prod here, right? I know what you're trying to do, right? But how about if you focus on training or there's the damn door, okay? I'm sure there's plenty of other people out in the world that'll take your money, allow you to spend time with them, give you a bunch of stuff for free, right? But they're in it for them, right? They, they need disciples. They need students to feel big about themselves, right? So, you know, they're just throwing stuff at you, okay? But anyway, right? The, the trick here with, at this stage is you don't change anything. There's no variations, no hanka allowed. No hanka. Hanka, for those of you who don't know, hanka means um, uh, like a, it's normally translated as variation, right? But it's an adaptive change, an adaptive change, right? The trick with hanka, right? If you go even deeper with this, this, this variation thing is that all the principles and concepts that the model is using or that the base kata or whatever is using, right? You're still doing. He still ends up in the same place, right? You still have the same kind of control, whatever. What you're doing is you're trading things out based on the situation that's going on, but nothing about the strategy, nothing about the strategic outcome changes, right? Nothing about what you're doing to him changes. Yes, I know. I traded out a punch for a kick or I traded out a punch for a uh, forceful grab or something like that, right? I traded out an omote gyaku for a mushadori, but if I trade out the omote gyaku for a ganseki nage, I'm now doing something different. Well, a lock and a hold, man. I mean, you just traded one lock or one hold for, yeah, but the direction I'm taking him and where he's going to end up is completely different. Okay. So Hatsumi Sensei, my teacher used to always make it a hard, like really tried to make people understand this that there's a huge difference between have, doing an authentic henka, an authentic variation of a kata. Any henka, to be an authentic henka, it has to be doing the same thing, so you still can, you still have the same kata name. I mean, if you do something else and, and you win, okay, great. But you can't call it the same thing. It's not a variation. It's something else, okay? But what he used to say is there's a huge difference between an authentic henka and doing whatever you want, Okay. So at the shoe, the again, this is traditional, right? A lot of Westerners have a problem with this because they don't like to be boxed in, right? And a lot of people these days, holy crap, right? You can't give them something without them just bombarding you with why, but why, but what if, but why, right? It sounds like a three-year-old, right? But why? Because I said so, right? Yeah, but, but can I do it this way? Sure, not here, right? And not now, right? Um, you know, so anyway, right? So the shoe, at the shoe stage, you are copying and preserving. What are you copying and preserving? You're copying the techniques and the and the and the, the skills and whatnot as they're being demonstrated, as they're as not just as they've been passed down, but you're copying your teacher's movement. Yeah, but what if my teacher's movements flawed? Well, any good teacher is still working on their stuff, okay? But what's it matter at the level where you are because you can't do it anyway, okay? So. <laughs> that's that's a that's a common uh, comeback from one of the master teachers in Japan. Uh, somebody will ask, "What school does this come from? What scroll does it come from? Why would I use it? When would I use it?" And he just looks at you and laughs and goes, "It doesn't matter. None of that matters because you can't do it anyway." Okay, so until you can do it, no other questions should matter. Okay, all right. So we get this. Any, any, any technique, right? Uh, almost like young, this outside wrist reversal, right? Okay. Then w there's a natural transition, right? It's not like one day you're doing one thing and another day you're doing another. As you really get this stuff, things start to happen and it starts to wake up your brain and whatever. But at this level, for people who belong at this level, they still have to think about where their foot goes, where their hand goes, where they're touching him, whatever, okay? So, and to stay on, on track, right? At the ha stage, ha here means to break. 
Okay. I, I know. But what about Odi? Odi, right? To break or breaking, right? Ha. In this case, ha. Break. Okay. So this is the this is the place where variation goes. Okay. Because now what you're going to do, since you know now know this, right? Okay. The guy does a single hand lapel grab. Okay. Great. Where on my lapel? Is it on center? Is it over here? Is he grabbing at the sleeve? How would I do it, right? How would I move from point A to point B, right? So I'm going to, in the beginning, I'm going to be fluctuating back and forth, right? So I'm adding more options up here because that's another way to do it, right? But there are these variations, right? Uh, when somebody grabs me, okay? So we're going to talk about this grab. And, and a lot of the basic model setups for locks, holds, and throws, it starts with a grab, right? It's either a kumuch or it's a single uh, lapel grab, Eddie G. May, uh, whatever, right? Or it's a sleeve grab. Uh, where on the sleeve, right? Is he grabbing up here? Is he grabbing at the elbow to, to help to lock the elbow and control the shoulder? Or is he way down here at the cuff, right? All that matters, okay? At this level, all of that matters, okay? So how do I bring the hand to me? Or do I go to the hand? That kind of thing, right? So, but at this stage, what we're really starting to focus on, again, timing, distancing, and angling. Timing, distancing, angling, right? Type of attack, okay? So if he's punching at me, how do I do an omotegyaku off of a punch? Well, I don't know. Is it a straight punch? Is it a back fist? Is it a hook? Is it an uppercut? Right? Where are you going to go? How do you loosen things up? Right? So that you create that. Because a grab is different and how you're creating things. Okay? So whatever. Right? Um, so again, you're breaking things up so that you get a better handle on how to do it with... There's some other ones in here. Right? Flow. Not flow as opposed to Alice. That's a different flow, right? <laughs> flow. Um, uh, there's a bunch of other things in there. Anyway, so we'll not kind of allude too much. But here, this is the stage where we start to break things up, right? So beginner, intermediate, we could say beginner, intermediate, advanced, but I know a bunch of people that have advanced belt levels, but mentally the way they think about their techniques, they're probably somewhere in here. Okay, and this is not me knocking anybody. We're talking about development. We're talking about development. Okay, if I get into training and this is my goal, and not how to handle certain problems that could come at me on the street, certain attack types, certain attacker types, certain situation types, or whatever, right? I'm going to be training very, very differently because one person is training to get the next color or the next level. The other person is training based on feeling satisfied or comfortable or acknowledging that, okay, yes, right? I, I can handle that type of person, but what about this change, right? Okay. And again, you can run through this way as well, okay? And then we here, again, we're back at that word transcend, okay? All right. Am I missing an S in there? Doesn't matter. Anyway, so he means to transcend, okay, to go beyond the technique, okay? So what, what, what I was always taught as a white belt was that we start with Shizen no Kamai, right? Shizen, Shizen, ne? okay? Shizen. We start with Shizen, and I'm not just standing here. There's something going on with the eyes, whatever, right? Weight distribution is in a certain place, right? We start with Shizen, and we end up with Shizen high natural body but we've had to have gone through all the other come I all the other things so that we understand that okay, it's like the Zen koan right in the beginning trees are trees mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers but to a student on the path trees are no longer trees rivers are no longer rivers and mountains are no longer mountains but to an enlightened master trees are once again trees Rivers are once again rivers, and mountains are once again mountains. Well, why bother with the student part if the master sees the same thing that the unenlightened person does? They don't. Okay? They don't. It's the process that makes what the master sees when he or she looks at a tree way different than what the unenlightened person sees 
when they look at a tree. Okay, it's very different. And if that's true about trees, rivers, and mountains, imagine what we're talking about when it comes to kamai, a lock, or a throw, or a kata, or whatever. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, again, this is just a way to kind of look through it, right? But each one of these things, there's a microcosm and a macrocosm going through things, right? Every time we do something, we could be working at this level, but we might, as an expedient, create a model so we can work through something to fix a mistake we keep making, okay? What people tend to do is they tend to confuse shitty technique that they salvaged by hook, crook, or luck as breaking the model and acceptable variation, okay? You can do whatever you want, okay? But that doesn't make it what you think or what you say you're doing, okay? Again, my, my, my new pet comment is, just because you call it call a, a dog's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Just because you call what you're doing needs to doesn't make it needs to. Right? As a matter of fact, most people calling what they're doing needs to aren't doing needs to. They're doing one tiny aspect of needs to. If that. All right. So. All right, let's continue going into the background of these things, okay? So remember what I said, we're gonna be focusing at the dynamics level, okay? Dynamics, principles, okay? So now what I'm looking at, dynamics, principles, okay? You know, timing, balance, distance, and all that. So we're gonna, we're gonna pick a, just for today, because of brevity, we're gonna pick one of these things, all right? So we're gonna take a look at balance control. Okay, and, and how our techniques are related to conditions. Okay, so here's what I want you to think about. Okay, um, in our Mikio, I don't know if you can, see, you can see these mandala back here and stuff, right? Okay, so in the exoteric philosophy that the esoteric is based on, so the mandala are these esoteric uh, tools for, uh, <laughs> for mastering what, most people are doing on the exoteric side. Exoteric means almost a obvious outer, right? Esoteric is uh, uh, secret, hidden, backside, right? We would say omote, uh, ura and omote, right? But so uh, for those of you who are familiar with the exoteric foundations for all this stuff, right? And the very foundation, right? One of the key home is the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths are, number one is the truth of suffering, okay? So... Human life is human life and it's messy, right? So it's it's imbued with suffering, right? People age, metal rust, right? Everything that's an accumulation breaks down, whatever, okay? But that sounds kind of pessimistic. Well, it's not about pessimistic, right? It's about realistic, right? So number two is the cause of suffering, okay? The cause of suffering, right? So if you told somebody, right, um, you know, life is suffering, well, they would say, well, why? Well, you know, suffering is caused, okay? And here are the causes that produce this state, okay? So one is the truth of, two is the truth of the cause of, right? Three is the better state, right? So um, it's the, uh, what's really going on in the background, right? So if you had a handle on the idea of cause and effect, then you could escape from that crap, right? You wouldn't be creating you wouldn't be causing suffering, discontent, anger, all that kind of crap, right? Okay, so how do I do that, right? So the number four is uh, usually just called the Noble Eightfold Path, right? So if I'm if I'm mindfully aware of these, as a minimum, these eight areas of my life, right? Then I will apply the rule of cause and effect, which is the natural law, right? To that, which now will produce better karmic states as opposed to causing negative karmic states to the greatest degree possible that we as human beings can do in this body, on this planet, in this environment, that kind of thing. But here's the secret, right? The, the four noble truths are written out inside out. They're written out backwards. Okay. So to an enlightened person, they would say, look, man, suffering is caused, right? The cause of suffering is Trishna. It's misdirected desire. Okay. And that produces these states. Okay. So it would really be written out to two, one, right? These things cause this, okay? But if we're mindful of these areas of our life, 
and we understand cause and effect, we can escape the suffering. Two, one, four, three. It's inside out. Well, shit, Sensei, why is it written the way it is? Because most human beings won't do anything unless there's a unless there's a promise of a reward or a threat of punishment. Okay? And to get where they want to go, they're going to ask why, how, all those kind of things, right? To an enlightened person, they already understand the process because it's all based on cause and effect. It's the same thing with this, okay? Things are often taught in a way to help entertain someone's ego so they stick around long enough to learn something in spite of themselves, okay? So, again, I'm at the second level of training. Of course, you have to know how to do an outside wrist reversal, inside wrist reversal, Colte Geis, right? Turning over the Colte, the, the wrist forearm area, right? Uh, also to not, you have to know these things to approach this. Of course, you can cheat it, but anyway, right? So, uh, we're gonna pick one of these, okay? So, we're gonna pick, um, we're gonna, we'll call it balance. I'm gonna lump two together balance and motion, okay? Balance and motion. Let's shoot, switch this out because I'm tired of writing in red, okay? So, balance and motion, okay? So, Here's, here's the thing, right? And again, we're going to stick to a very specific model because otherwise this is going to get too long and drawn out and get more confusing than it might already be, okay? We're going we're to base it off of the base model, the setups, right? Because how things are happening is going to determine how you do the next thing. That whatever. It's cause and effect. Remember, everything goes to cause and effect. Your kata are teaching cause and effect. Cause and effect. Okay, so balance and motion. So here's the thing. When someone grabs you, I don't care if it's kumuge. I don't care if it's a wrist grab. I don't care if it's a single lapel grab. I don't care if it's a choke from behind, whatever. When someone grabs you, right? When someone grabs your body, your clothing, whatever, okay? They're going to do one of three things, right? And if you can, you can think about this. If you can take any aspect and divide it into three subsets, that gives you three perspectives, to come at things, okay? Um, in Mikyo, it's eight, okay? And here's how this is also mirrored in the Bujinkan, right? Think about this, right? We have nine lineages that Hatsumi Sensei had Soke ship to, okay? Uh, let's pull this one. Is that center right there? Okay, this is the enlightened state, okay? These are primary mindsets and these are primary activities of the mindsets that produce that. Okay? We can take that same model and look at how many, how many lineages? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Typically, we see the gyoko ryu, right, as the crux of everything. Okay? So we have these nine other perspectives on a fight. Okay? As you progress up in your training, Systematically, each one of these will take its turn going into the center, and the gilko to you now becomes another variation with something else in the middle. Okay, it's a pretty cool thing. I know nobody's teaching that shit either. Anyway, all right, so all right, balance and motion. So when somebody's grabbing you, they're doing it to do one of three things. One of three things. Okay, could there be a combination? Maybe, okay? Uh, if we're on the ground, it's going to be a little bit different because on the ground, all the all the, uh, all of the uh, principles that operate that you have to operate with standing are going to be reversed. okay? It's not the same. okay You don't have to worry about somebody tripping you or breaking your balance and knocking you on the ground, right? So you don't have to worry about being a biped and neutralizing the force of gravity on your body or those kind of things once you're already on the ground, okay? Sneaks in every once in a while, depending on which position you're in, but it's not the same, okay? So when somebody uh, grabs you, they're going to do one of uh, three things. They're going to pull you somewhere, they're going to push you somewhere, or they're going to hold you in place to do something else, okay? So they're going to push you somewhere, they're going to pull you somewhere, or they're going to hold you in place to do something else. This could be overt, trying to shove you into a wall, or pull you to them. Come here. That kind of thing, right? 
or it could just be just the way he's grabbing. So those variations at the high level, right? It's not just if he grabbed the lapel. Is it a pushing grab? Is it an overt pushing grab, right? Is it a grab in which when he grabs, your body gets, there, there's some pressure on it. It doesn't have to be a big one. Just there's pressure on it, okay? Or when he grabs, right? The way he grabs, does it do a little bit of a pull? Or is it an overt pull, right? All those things matter. Otherwise, we're just trained monkeys regurgitating kata, okay? So, and, and again, you get really, really, really good at that, right? And you can get really good at fighting. But are you using what you've learned in that context, right? So he's pulling you somewhere, he's pushing you somewhere, he's holding you some, or he's holding you to do something else, okay? So I want you to think about your kata, or I want you to think about your techniques, your waza, okay? So we have techniques... where we are being pulled or we're pulling him, which means we're getting him, his motion is forward, off his feet, okay? We have techniques, okay? Or times that we're gonna do certain techniques when we're being pushed or when we're moving him backward. Okay, forward off his toes, backward off his heels. We have different techniques for that. Okay, can you make one technique that's designed for one thing, do the other? Absolutely. Okay, and it, until you can do things this way, that doesn't matter. Okay, and then we have techniques for when both they're holding me in place or We're dealing with resistance, okay? He's locked down, not moving. Okay? So very quickly, let me grab a different color here. Fell off earlier, all right? So let's look at three different wrist reversals, right? Why are you taught three different wrist reversals, Okay. Right? Was it just so you could have a high number of things? Well, we have three wrist reversals in our in our lineage, and we have 27 throws, and we have 72 toe kicks to the eye joint, whatever, okay? Um, the problem with most people is they can't think beyond a third grade or a third, a three-year-old's um, mindset where they're given things, and then they just blindly accept it. Well, my mom and dad told me that this was true, and they would never lie to me. My teacher told me that this was true, and he or she would never lie to me. My teacher told me lots. At a certain point, I will lie to you. It's the only way I can see if you're actually thinking for yourself, okay? So anyway, right? So we have a technique, primary technique, omote gyaku, right? This outside wrist reversal, okay? So we'll borrow the, the koto general kind of way of doing things where the hand is moved out online, hand, shoulder, shoulder, not hand out here, and then the shoulders back, right? It's out this way, okay? because everything backfires. There's a whole other whiteboard Wednesday. We talk about where these locks, they all center on the T8, T9 junction in the middle of your thoracic, right? Uh, in the torso, in the spine, okay? Not, we're not here to teach that today, okay? So if I'm moving in backwards, right? I have the omote gyaku technique, okay? What about forward, okay? If I do this ura gyaku, Okay, it's gonna take him forward, okay? So it's the opposite. If I turn the hand in the other direction, moves him in that direction, okay? Well, what about, right? He goes to do this, right? And he locks down on me. His arms are big, whatever, right? And we get this thing, right? And then we have this technique called Hong Yang. Sorry, board's moving around here. That's an H, okay? Hongyaku, okay? Hongyaku is you start to do this thing and he resists and he just cranks straight down and it drops him straight down, okay? Again, you can go, I highly recommend that you go find the other uh, Whiteboard Wednesday where I covered a bunch of these things and how they go together. But we have a bunch of other techniques that take somebody forward 
we have Gan Sekinage. Okay. Ganseki. Okay. We give people four different variations of Ganseki. Okay. One, almost two, make the person go forward. Okay. There's a pull to it, right? I bring them around or I step out and it starts to turn into something called Musha Dori, right? But Musha Dori is also down here. Whoops, Musha Dori, right? I get this guy's arm out to the side, but I don't feel like I can pull him anywhere or where, where, where whatever, right? So I take advantage of the weakness in the elbow joint, crank into that baby, right? Okay? Musha, it's not an A. Musha Dori, right? I know, I have sloppy handwriting. Anyway, my mom used to always say, based on my handwriting, I should be a doctor. Now, most doctors, you know, your prescriptions are printed now or just sent right to the to the uh, uh, pharmacy. But if you're old like me, right, they used to handwrite this stuff out. And then you'd take it and somehow they translated it. So my mom used to always say I should be a doctor because of my handwriting. And I never could correlate handwriting with my ability to save people's lives. Go figure. Anyway, right. So what about Omote Gyaku? Taking him backwards, right? Well, we have Osoto Nage, right? Great outer throw, right? What else do we have taking somebody backwards? We have Musha Dori. We have Mus, uh, Musha Dori Onikudaki, right? Musha Dori Onikudaki, right? We have all these things, right? Where am I taking it, right? Where does it go? Where does it take it? Now, ultimately, again, for my guys for Nidon, does it matter? No, because their job is to learn how to flow with somebody and get them going where they need them to, or where the person's already going. Okay. One of the lessons, I think it's in the Tagagi Yoshin scrolls, it says the secret for having always having the right technique is to never do a technique that's not already working. Okay. So for Nidan, right, if he's going in that direction, just fit in, right? But what if he's not? What if I'm, what if I'm a cop and I need this person, right? I don't do that anymore, but what if I need this person? Down, face first, right? If I do something to take him down on his back, now what? Now I got to wrestle or me and two other guys, right? While other people are screaming police brutality because they have never dealt with an enraged individual and don't know how freaking strong one of these people can be, right? Or somebody going through dementia or whatever, right? So now it's going to take a whole bunch of extra work to get them flipped over and all that kind of stuff. It'd be a whole lot easier if I would just apply the right technique that allows him to come down like, uh, you know, plane doing a one point landing with no landing gear, right? So, but what if, right? He's either resisting or he's going out, right? If, if his normal thing is to, is to always be moving this way, right? How do I get this guy to go that way? Right? Because ultimately, remember I said this, this level is super, super important, not just because of Henka, not just because of variation, because it's the bridge between learning the techniques and that intense staging level, that advanced level, where you're able to actually let go, transcend the art, and actually be able to do what needs to be done. And what is that? Fulfill your intent. My intent is... I need this guy down on his face, chest down. Ultimately, that's what I need. I can either work really hard to get it or I can make it happen, right? So, again, working through dynamics and principles, I start to get the idea, right? Okay. Now, not only might he pull, push, or hold me, I've got a human body too. When I put my hands on him, I'm either going to pull him somewhere, push him somewhere, or hold him to do something else. Okay. Now that could be that the whole crux of things, or it could be, I start to do something and then I do something else because through this level, the principles and whatnot, right? We need to start training and understanding natural human response. Okay. Whether it's to hold our balance to not stumble and fall over, or it's to resist an oncoming threat it doesn't matter, right? The human body always moves 180 degrees away from danger or the threat. It either does it to save itself, like you reach out and you didn't realize that thing was hot, and right, you moved away this way, 
or you get pinched and it's moving away from the danger, right? I know how dull that sounds, but the way a lot of people train, you would never know that they can actually walk the talk that they spew, okay? So if I understand that he's going to resist anything I do, right? Nobody in the world except your training partner is going to let you do this shit to them. Whatever. Nobody's going to allow you to do it. Okay. So you have to do, you either have to learn how to slip something on in a way that they are busy doing something else and can't stop it because their energy and motion is somewhere else. Right. Or you get them doing one thing and their own reaction gives you what you need. What it really comes down to is you either need to create what you need or you need to let him create it and then you're going to ride it off. In a real life everyday thing, we can either go with the flow, go with the masses, or we can instigate something that creates the masses moving. Right? In one case, I don't care where we're going. You guys want to go out to eat? Where you want to go? Oh, that's fine with me. Okay. I'll find something on the menu. That's going with the flow. Okay. Otherwise, you know, I'm really in the mood for ribs, right? Um, this place and this place and this place has have, have really good ones. That place, they suck. Um, you know, I mean, you guys don't have to get ribs, but I'd really prefer these. You guys have a, have a choice about one of these? See, now when they move, what are they going to pick from? Chances are they're going to pick from one of those three because I've already narrowed it down. Gave my reasons for it because the word because is a huge influencer on human psychology, right? Uh, see, again, learning the why, okay? Learning how to make that kind of stuff happen, right? Okay? So now if I if I want to do, let's say, uh, an osoto nage, right? That rear hip throw, okay? When I grab somebody, chances are, even in training, right? You've, you've Even at white belt level or whatever, you put your hands on somebody, if they have a fear of falling or they're just an asshole, right? They, they're just going to do everything they can to stop you to prove that your technique doesn't work or whatever, right? As soon as you grab them, what's going to happen? For most people, 98.9% .9 of people are going to, they're going to start to lock down and stiffen up, okay? Which means you can't do soft training for that. You either have to find another training partner or do what's needed to make them move, okay? So what I might do is create something akin to a push. So we're in Kumiuch, right? And I, as soon as I touch it, right? If you're not if you haven't learned from these monitoring hands, like Koto to you, Goko to you, whatnot has, right, in a lot of these things, right, and where you're touching, that you're not actually sensing, you're not paying attention to the muscle tension and the resistance and the preparation that's already going on, and you're beyond that first level of training, you're not paying attention, okay? And that's forcing you to, to do more than you need to do, okay? So what I could do from this position right here is, remember, I needed to go Otsodonage is going to take him backwards off his heels, right? It's the ura gyaku. I'll come back to that in a minute, okay? So what I might do is, since I have a hand on his lapel and I have a hand on his sleeve, what I might do is pinch here or drive a boshi ken in here and do a pulling pinch to his skin here or like cocking a pistol or flicking a lighter or something like that on this hoshi point right here. So what's the body do? There's pain. Oh, that's going to move. And there's a pinch right here, right? So I get him already doing what I want. So now all I need to do is move. All I need to do is, is keep what he's doing going farther. Okay? So that's one way I might do it, right? So now I'm not just going to do push, pull, step, blah, 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 right? I'm going to he's, – he's locked down, right? So I'm going to cause him to move in the direction that I want him to go. Okay. Or what I might do is the opposite strategy where we have this and he's resisting, right? So what I'm going to do is rest my hands. And then when I take him, I'm going to take him in a way that pulls on his clothing. What's he going to do? He's going to fire more of his posterior muscles to not be pulled forward. He's pulling. He doesn't think of it as pulling. Most people don't think of it as pulling. They think of it as holding, but he's not holding. He's not locking everything down. He's pulling back against my pull. So I simply pull and immediately go because I know as soon as I do this, 
He's going to resist it, but that resistance is a pull in the opposite direction. So I convince him that I'm pulling him to me only to move in the direction. So what, what he's going to feel in this case is not being pinched and, and avoiding, right? What he's going to experience is that same thing we've all or most of us have experienced where you see a box with crap in it or a bag or something and you go to pick it up thinking that it's heavier than it is. And then you realize it's not, right? So you, muscles get ready and all that. And all of a sudden, shit's on the ceiling. It's all scattered around. Be There's that where you go to push on a door and somebody's opening it at the same time. And you had that little fall thing. That's what he's going to experience, okay? So there are these ways to make this happen, okay? What about the hold things, okay? Well, either it's... I'm just going with what he's doing because we have throws. We have variations of ganseki. We also have, have osotogake, uh, oso this leg sweep. We have uh, uchimata and uchigake from the front, all those kind of things, right? Well, if I'm in the middle of one of these throws and he locks down and I lose forward movement or rear movement, then I kick his base out from under, right? So if we can categorize our techniques – from a what the hell is going on or what is it that I'm actually creating, right? It's another way to organize your techniques that's actually closer to situational than just kata collecting, than just trying to memorize things, okay? All right, running out of time here. So I started to hint at something and I, I need to not do that, okay? So again, we could, we could spend an entire weekend seminar looking at how deep the rabbit hole goes, okay? But principles. Okay, principles. Your omote gyaku and your ura gyaku, and by extension, your hon gyaku, right? You learn them as techniques, okay? And they have a certain meaning to you. But what is omote gyaku doing? It doesn't matter if it's the kotoryu version or if it's the gyokoryu version. This moves them in a way, right? Omote, right? outside throws them outside the bubble it takes them off their heels out and away okay Uda -gyaku. okay it's easiest to break somebody's balance off the heels there's a whole other whiteboard wednesday on that right so tabby feet right okay. i know big old fat club foot right okay tabby foot <laughs> Right? So, omote gyaku, right? Taking them off the heels. Because it's easy. They, we don't have a, an extension of the foot back there and toes to lock down and keep from falling backwards. So, it's easiest to knock somebody backwards. Omote, your primary. Okay? Uda is the opposite. But again, go look at the other video. It's not just taking them forward, right? I need to be able to take them right off their feet. The problem with with going forward for a human body is that their, their balance line is not here. It's way out here. It's way out in front of my body. For me, it's way out here. All right, let me move this, right? See where it is? The reason for that is when he starts to torque my arm, I can just fold for my primary joint. See where it is? It's way out here. And if I have all that ability to move, I can take a step and save myself, okay? Uda Gyaku is about how to move that back here. So now I will be taking him off his toes. Okay? So Uda Gyaku, right, takes them off their toes, but we have to move the balance line. This is harder. That's why this is Uda, back, hidden. There's something that's hidden Right? It's not just the opposite direction. It's we need to understand this and we need to understand this. Right? Because it's not as easy as, well, one goes this way, one goes that way. Okay, fantastic. You stay in preschool and let the big boys train. Okay? Not you, because you're all in light. Okay? Anyway, and then the last one, right? Hon Gyaku. Right? Bring it over, locking down. Right? So now what we're doing is breaking them down on their feet, right? We're jamming them up. 
collapsing them on their feet. Okay. So you don't want to move. Fantastic. You stay right there. Okay. I'm perfectly fine with that. But what, what Hong Gyaku does is it's not about here. Hong Gyaku is three dimensional. Hong Gyaku is up here. Okay. So if I tweak this, right, what I do is effectively make his knees move more so it cuts down, diminishes the distance between his hips and the floor. So now it's harder for him to move these things because I make the distance between this joint and the floor shorter than his legs, way shorter than his legs. And now he can't move. Now you can just kick him over. It's like putting him in a vice. You can hit, take whatever tool you want and hammer the shit out of him or whatever you want to hammer at him. Doesn't have to be shit. Okay. Anyway, right? So here's the thing, right? Omote Gyaku introduces you to the Omote Gyaku principle. But you have lots of techniques that use the Omote Gyaku principle to work. Take him off his heels. Osotonage, Mushiadori, Onikudaki, whatever, okay? Now, there's variations of these things that do the Hong Gyaku thing, but let's just keep it simple, right? Uda Gyaku introduces you to the principle of Uda Gyaku, moving that back so that it's easier to throw somebody to take them forward so they can't adjust, right? We have lots of techniques that operate using the Uda Gyaku principle to work, okay? Otherwise, he just... A human being, you start to take him forward. How many times do you have had a partner? Just step. And then you got to do something tricky to screw him up. Or it just turns into a wrestling match, and then one person gets up like, yeah, I won that one. Yeah, what, what a mess. Really? You look like a freaking caveman barely outside the cave. Okay? I get it. You won. But it was no different than what everybody else is doing. So you just spent all that time, effort, and money doing what? Ending up like everybody else. Well, that was smart. Okay. So anyway, and then home Gyaku, right, teaches you how to break them down, lock them in place, and be able to affect their legs so that mobility goes away, right, or that you can take them off their feet. What you're, what you're doing is dropping. So one is moving them this way, one's moving them this way, and one is causing them to drop, okay? This is introducing you to the home Gyaku principle, which, by the way, this is existent in both of these as well, but... That's another class, okay? And then we have techniques that use the Hongyaku principle, okay? You need to transcend the kata, the technique, the form, to enter the realm of the formless so that you can operate in ways that most people, especially your attacker, will never understand. If he doesn't know what you're doing to him, he can't beat it. And if you're doing it right, his attempt to beat it feeds your technique, Again, something else I was taught at White Belt. If your technique is correct, it doesn't matter if you're applying the pressure or he's resisting against it. If you have it correct, both instances, the technique backfires on him. It doesn't backfire on you. If you have to work harder, faster, stronger, or whatever, technique sucks. Just like if you're in a kamai and you can't step with one foot or the other to step or kick without moving your torso first, your come eyes wrong. Okay. But that's another whole other whiteboard Wednesday. Right. So this is what we got. Right. Again, looking at the backside of things, unless you have a foundation on these, on these, uh, uh, these, uh, locks, holds and throws. Again, we have at least one other whiteboard Wednesday where I string these things together and I'm looking at the, the, uh, the different locks, holds and throws from a long, mid, and close range um, uh, positioning, right? Where now for Henka, right, if I'm trying to take him off his heels, if I'm really close to him, if I'm mid-range or if I'm long range, I already have a tool in my toolbox for doing the thing I need to do. I just use the tool that's going to continue to make that happen, right? It's like having screwdrivers. If you only have a flathead and a Phillips, then, okay, but you might need a power drill. You might need what? Or not a power drill, a power uh, screwdriver, whatever. They come in different things, right? It might not be a screw. It might be a bolt. But either way, you're turning something in or out, right? 
So you get the same principle, right? You have different tools for different jobs, okay? Screwdrivers that are really short-handled, really nubby, mid, long, thin, thick, right? Because they're designed for different things. The principle is the same. I need to screw something in or out, but how much pressure, how much force? Are there other things in the way? What kind of space or, or whatever do I, right? It, situational starts to change, right? That third level of training, transcending the model to make it real in real time, in the real world, okay? Anyway, that's what I have for today. We are going to be doing more of this on Friday. There's your little uh, URL right there for the Friday virtual training. My Ninpo Masterclass guys, they're already coming to class twice a week anyway, but you can do that uh, for four ninety nine. dollars What we're gonna be taking a look at on um, Friday, right, two days from now, is applying some of this stuff. As a matter of fact, let me bring up my notes here. Um, bum, 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 bum. I know you're watching me type. I should have probably left this on before I started the class, but I didn't. So let's see, Friday. Dun, dun, dun. I'll just read the headline. Uh, how to go beyond technique to control any attacker and create the exact outcome you want. So Friday's class, we're going to be taking a look at it's like in billiards where you call your shot. Which pocket is the ball going into? Okay. Now, your skill set has to be correct to make that happen, right? So we're going to be taking a look at the situational control. I need to move this person in this particular direction for whatever reason, right? So which technique does that? Okay. So we're going to be looking at those variables to make sure that we understand these things a little bit better. Now, again, if you're just starting, give it a shot, right? But the Friday classes, since we're on Zoom, you get real time to look at those kind of things. And as you're moving your body around, I can see and I can give you some hints and tips, like if you're leaning your, your head or your shoulders too far or whatever. I mean, if you have a training partner to work with, that'd be great. You can both show up for it, right? But if you're working solo, I'll give you variations of things to work on for a solo student, okay? And again, $4.99 US, the cheapest you're going to work with me. But uh, you know, as they say, give it a shot, right? Uh, and if not, no harm, no foul. I should have just given you enough here to take you multiple levels ahead, unless you're a master troll, uh, a master who is also a troll, not just a master troll. We've all seen those people, right? Where you just showed up, you know, you already know everything. You just wanted to see how much full of shit I was or whatever, right? In which case, show up or don't, okay? So, but anyway, here, here it is. Uh, in a short amount of time here, we'll have everything set up on the Friday uh, page. You can go there now, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get things all set up so that the recording is all set up and uh, like and share these things, right? Get them out so other people can benefit from the lessons. If you know of anybody that is into this deep level stuff, if not, again, no harm, no foul, right? Um, post some comments down below. What was your biggest aha moment? Uh, you know, what was new for you? Uh, whatever. Okay. And if you're going to disagree or have dissent, that's fine. Uh, just make sure it's clean because I have access to the delete button, right? No crap on my pages. Um, I'm okay with you disagreeing, but if you're going to disagree, have a better argument than my friend's second cousin got jumped by a guy and got stabbed with a knife and he, there was nothing he could do about it. Because the first question I'm going to ask is how trained was your friend's second cousin. Okay. So uh, anyway, right. And if you're just going to throw another one out where I'm old, fat and bald, you'll come and just kick my ass. You know what, whatever makes you happy, but I'm still going to delete your comment because it's just an ass, ass's comment. All right. That's it. That's all I have. I will see everybody next week on Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. See you then. Be safe. Train hard. Have a great week.